The Disrupt Education vlog can be found on YouTube. To hear it in podcast form, search Disrupt Education on any of the following podcast platforms. Anchor, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Breaker, CastBox, Overcast, Radio Public, Pocket Cast, Spotify, or Stitcher. Welcome to this episode of Disrupt Education. I'm Peter Hostrosser. I am here with two co-founders of some amazing e-learning platforms, formerly VP Legacies. We are to be determined right now, but we're leaning towards a place, but I'll let them talk about that. Johnny and Hector are here with me. Guys, thank you so much for being here on the podcast. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, we, um, Hector and I, it's really cool. So we met the first day of college. Hector um, uh, was the crazy Greek in the corner, and he said um, uh, at our floor meeting, um, he stood up and he's like, everyone, we should go skydiving. Um, So so, so our our A comes in and he's like, hey, what kind of group building activities do you guys want to do this year? And I'm in the corner scared uh, uh, for my life when I go up in really high places which is ironic now because now I go up in really high places pretty often. But um, Hector <laughs> stands up and he says, we should all go skydiving. I was very scared of his idea, but I thought he was really cool. So we um, became friends pretty uh, pretty soon after that. Awesome, so. awesome. And and Hector, yeah, you did mention, uh, Johnny, you're a climber and you have done some amazing <laughs> climbing. Uh, and and Hector, you got him up in the uh, in the plane and jumped, huh? Tell tell us a little bit about uh, like that. So so we never went skydiving. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still working on it, Peter. I am still working. He on did. It. You know, man. Um, I went. So I went. Yeah, I went skydiving when I was 19 years old uh, uh, or 20, um, and it, it was it was incredible, and uh, it was just such a thrill. So I'm still working on it. Uh, I'm still working on getting Johnny out on that plane and jumping for for life and having some fun. So we'll <laughs> see if I can make it happen. But yeah, you know, just going off what Johnny said, you know, it's uh, it's just been an incredible ride. You know, just it's one of those entrepreneurship stories where you know two uh, two guys meet, they become best friends right from the start. Right, you know, that we start off in business school. I'm studying marketing, international business. Johnny's studying accounting. Um, film does his MBA as well. And, you know, we have some similar core business classes before, you know, our degrees take, takes us to those specialized classes. And in those core classes, we had so much fun. We were staying up till 3 a.m. eating Jimmy John's ultimate porker, best sandwich, you know, <laughs> doing projects. And, you know, okay. at the end of that university career, you know, we started businesses, you know, uh, with one another during our university career. And, you know, finally, when we graduated, Right. We were just like after about, oh, Johnny, what was it, man? About, you know, six months to 12 months. And we said, why not go all in together? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Hector had already. Um, so I stayed um, and did a, um, a fifth year. So I did my MBA in one year. Um, and uh, Hector had already been doing the entrepreneurial thing. I was doing it, but I was part time. And then when I graduated, I went and worked for Waterhouse Coopers for. Let's see. We're being recorded, so I gotta like actually have like accurate time frame. <laughs> um, you can always uh, say around this. Around. <laughs> well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. It was like November fourteenth, twenty fourteen, or give or take a day or two. I wasn't that excited when I left um, to remember the day like I do. Um, it w- was my last day. It wasn't because the company was was bad. It was an amazing company. I actually really enjoyed working for Pricewaterhouse Coopers and learned a ton um and one of the things i learned actually was that um how education specifically continuing education for my degree and my license my cpa license was um less than ideal in an online setting (laughs) um and that's just how it was i mean like that was 2014 um that just seemed a little it was behind where I thought it should be at that point with the technology we have. So um, that was really why I wanted to make the shift from, um, well, I wanted to make the shift because I really wanted my own business and right. and, and work with, with Hector full time. But that was 
why e-learning, why online education. And I also, uh, I didn't really grow up with um, any learning differences, but I did struggle reading like my entire life. And I struggled with comprehension re related to reading. And I think that's one of the reasons why the online learning that I was taking for these different courses I struggled with was because it was all text-based. There was like no audio, no video, it was all text-based. Mm -hmm. And what Hector and I focus on now is micro learning, specifically um, micro video learning mm -hmm. and producing that at scale for our clients. Got so it. that is uh, when we actually started VP Legacies on um, April 15th. 2015. So I guess we're in year six or six to seven. I, I'm going to count if I can't do math. Well. <laughs> <laughs> it was when we started it, which is, which is funny. So. Right. Yeah. So right on tax day. So that was your pain point was obviously understanding because now video and, and audio are part of literacy, right? That, that have actually changed yeah. in the pain point. Now, Hector, you have a little bit different of an angle here coming in on education. Your pain point was a little bit different. Um, can you kind of explain uh, how, what, how did e-learning come to fruition with you? Obviously, you knew Johnny already, but what did that look like? What was that pain point in education? No, Peter, I'm so happy that you asked that question as well. You know, education to me, man, is everything, right? Um, and uh, so I just a little about my story and, and how I fell in love with education. Um, so first, I'm 100% Greek. Right. My brother and I, we were the ones first born outside of Greece, you know, so we definitely break plates, eat lamb and <laughs> dance all night long. Uh, and uh, my parents literally live on the same block as me. So if you've seen my big fat Greek wedding, big shout out, Chicago, let's go. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, but, you know, when my father and my mother, uh, they, they migrated here to the United States and my father ended up taking a job down in Saudi Arabia at Saudi Aramco Oil Company, and he worked in IT. So right from the start, I grew up in this melting pot of culture, right? You know, talk about diversity and inclusion from religion to cultural background to where people are from. Uh, you know, I was just very lucky to be born in a community like that. Uh, but it wasn't just that. It was also we had the opportunity to travel a lot. You know, we right now, Johnny and I were in Colorado. To fly from Colorado to Boston, it's like a five-hour flight. That's how long it took us to almost get to Bangkok, Thailand from Saudi Arabia. I mean, that's, that's how close the world was, right? So we had the opportunity to travel a lot. And, uh, you know, one of my favorite stories to share is when I was in Cambodia. I learned a lot. and My life was impacted in these developing countries. And I went to Cambodia. And we were in this tourist location, you know, multiple, you know, tour groups, you know, when you see the little flags and, you know, uh, you know, where which tour group is from, right, what language they speak. But it was really cool because, uh, you know, after being in this tourist location for some time, different tour groups from different parts of the world, about 15 or 20 kids, you know, local to the region, they came running up to us, right? You know, ripped shirts, no shoes, and in perfect English was, they were asking every group, you know, where are you from? Right. And they would ask, you know, where are you from? And one tour group would say France and the kids would yell out Paris. And then they would ask the other tour group, where, where are you from? And they would say England. They would shout out London. And it was just so cool to, to watch this, you know, experience. And I'll never forget what our tour guy uh, turned around and told us. You know, he turned around and he said, you know, to these kids, education is everything. It's not just their way out of their circumstance, but it's a way for them to reinvest in their communities to help their communities thrive. And I fell in love with that. And that's part one. And part two of the story is I grew up with all sorts of learning differences, right? I'm dyslexic through the roof, um, ADD, have all sorts of learning differences to the point where I went to a high school that you could not be accepted unless you had learning differences, specifically dyslexia. I had to have a report from a specialist. I believe she was a psychologist showcasing that, yes, indeed, Hector is very dyslexic. But here's the thing, Peter, I was very lucky because my parents not only could financially support me, but they could also emotionally support me as well. Because back then and even, you know, years before my generation, if you were dyslexic or had learning differences, you were quote unquote dumb or special mm -hmm. needs, which is a bunch of bull crap, as we know. Right. Yep. You know, and I was very lucky to have a family that was very supportive emotionally and financially. So I wanted to give back. I knew education was the way to help people thrive and to help people that have those challenges academically to thrive um, as well. So when Johnny and I met and we just had that love for entrepreneurship, love for business, love for education, it is so cool to think 
that with one device, one simple connection, you can change somebody's life. So that's why we're super passionate uh, about online learning, e-learning, the way that it has grown. It, it, it was important, but now it's like urgent, right? right. You know, because with COVID, 2035 online learning happened now. Like, the, you know, it's just so important <laughs> now. It's like we're years ahead because of what happened. And Johnny and I are just so excited because one thing that we'll dig a little bit more into this podcast, I'm sure, is that people are scrambling. They're trying yeah. to figure out online learning. They're trying to figure out how to set up their strategy, how to implement, how to grow at scale. There's so many pieces to the online learning engine, and we bring that full A to Z solution. Yeah, I, you know, we've had a conversation before, and I, and I love that. Um, you know, I love the fact that, that you're using that term differences. It's not like deficiency or anything else, which or disabilities. I, disabilities. Yeah, I, I think that's it should be, you know, a superpower, you know, and as you can harness it and sure. and this is me and this is where I can go further. And and that's what's amazing. So I want to kind of dig into uh, the the e-learning in this. So you have just been both of you have been working in education just uh, just prior basically to the COVID hit and, and all that. Um, it started with, I'm guessing with businesses and, and those types of things and where you started to uh, put some lessons together, which I love as a, a business educator. That's kind of where, you know, everything kind of starts there. Um, however, you've been able to, to transition a little bit and help that urgent need um and but you were a little bit in front of the curve as well can you can you tell us a little bit about how that start with business kind of worked itself into education and what that transition has been like uh since you know march 13th which is what we call d-day in uh in education <laughs> in 2020 yeah it's interesting so we traditionally started working with um business bu businesses building internal training programs that's what we did. Um, we still do it, but that's not the only thing we do in e-learning now. Um, so we started doing that to help scale at the time, really scale. It's funny because I say like at the time, but now it's like so obvious to people. You used to have to like sell people on this. Like, mm -hmm. hey, it's like way cheaper to like record all your trainings, implement it into an LMS, and then scale it out to all of your current hires, new hire, all this stuff. Mm-hmm. You don't have to really sell people on that now. You used to have to like sell people on, hey, this you're gonna. Uh, I'm I'm an accountant um, as well, and one of the things that we was focused on is uh, return on investment um, for our clients. So that's why that's where, why we started with internal training, um, and the other why with that is, um, like I said, I was like, hey, I'm taking these CP these CPE trainings, but I'm not really learning anything. Right. Sorry, accounting boards and anyone watching this. The reality is, <laughs> I wasn't listening. <laughs> what everyone else does with certifications and, and trainings, that there's just you check the box. Right. When I do anything, I'm like, it's a waste of 80 hours every two years, you know? Like, so that's why we started there. When COVID hit, we, the need from the ROI that we saw that businesses could get. Trans translated um, very quickly to the education industry, to large institutions, but also like individuals at large in institutions. Mm -hmm. Because as we all know, education and traditional education has been fighting this stuff for years because there was no perceived ROI in it. Right. right? Or less than the current landscape. So, it's interesting. We honestly still haven't really worked with any like large scale universities or anything, but we have been working with individual professors at large universities, right? Universities. Right. Um, so that's been really cool. So we went from just focusing on a B two B market, uh, working on internal training, to actually also helping individuals so um and that's been really interesting because there's a different pain point for helping individuals and these educators these teachers we were working with a lot of professors a lot of teachers and that is how do they both develop their 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 course mm -hmm. and then how do they sell it 
Yeah. So that is a new question that we've really, we, we've actually been doing R&D um, internally for a couple of years on the best practices on selling um, um, education or e-learning. And um, that's not something that we had to focus on before because we were just internal. But now that we're external and internal, right, building, working with these individuals and, um, and then small businesses also selling training, um, and selling, um, not, not just training, but just education. Mm-hmm. Um, we've had to adapt and help these, help all of our clients figure out the best way, the most effective ways to get the training in front of their learners as quickly as possible. And part of that is, uh, helping them with the purchase decision too. Right. So that's a big thing that changed since what is it march 13th is it you we were we were like solely internal training and then all of a sudden the need for everyone and their uncle (laughs) wanting (laughs) to create um an online course and learning the best way to do that occurred and that's why we have a long list of clients that we're helping with that now right right sales is, is really the hardest piece that we've um, seen in the in the industry. It's like, how do you? And and this is what why VP Legacies or at the to be determined <laughs> e-learning partners, um, we focus on like our number one focus is the learners. Are yeah. the learners number one focus? Yeah. Like like clients will ask us. They're like, what? Uh, so what kind of content should I build? Um. Well, we're just going to ask your learners. So. Just ask them before you hire us. Ask them. Yes. Yeah. Um, and that's what we, we, we've told so many clients, prospective clients, like just have a conversation <laughs> with your learners, and they're going to tell you exactly what they want. I love the um, the obviously it's it's student first, and I think that's what we're figuring out. I'm in in the actual traditional system. Um, you, you're likely getting everything at you right now, um, and that's what's interesting um, because we are very rigid in the system. I don't know if you're getting that right, even at the university level. Um, but Hector, tell us a little bit about like those conversations and how do you change that mindset? Um, because even your own story uh, is something that is really tangible uh, for a learner-centered kind of e-learning platform or e-learning uh, strategies that you create. Oh, of course. Absolutely, Peter. Um, you know, and, and one thing, you know, we're, we're, we're not saying this to put any traditional university down or district down. We're saying this out of pure love. Yes. Right? And, you know, th- they're just really slow. Mm-hmm. Right. There's so many layers to make one decision. And, you know, we somehow have a $4 million budget to buy a gym, but we don't have a $1,000 budget to start creating some e-learning. Right. <laughs> you know, so, you know, you just kind of feel like, we have to, you know, really see where where is uh, we're not saying get rid of schooling right. uh, as far as traditional schooling, right? You know, it is bringing the healthy boundary of both of them together, mm-hmm. right? You know, and it's inevitable. We're already starting to go there, right? Um, and especially in this world of high tech, you know, one thing that you know we like to say this TikTok generation of you know we want to learn things fast and in micro bits, you know, sixty seconds or less, uh, you know, uh, to to keep, to capture that attention. We're, we're headed that way, right? You know, so we want schools, you know, not not just to, of course, keep embracing those campuses, bringing students to campuses, also keep embracing online learning, keep investing in online learning, because it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier is that you will expand your impact as an educator, as an educational institution. Not only can you impact the students coming to your campus, but you can impact not just the millions, but the billions out there that need help, that need that the education that you could provide with them as long as they have that dev- device and connection. But going to what Johnny said, Peter, yeah, the learner is the most important thing. You know, I can't tell you, how, you know, what, what's important to us. What, what is kind of our slogan, right? Save time, save money, and alleviate stress. We cannot tell you how many times, you know, we've opened, you know, we popped open the hood uh, with our clients and they are spending thousands of hours and dollars figuring out the perfect learning management system, figuring out this and figuring out that and only to leave themselves pulling their hair, trying to figure out why things aren't working. Here, let me tell you a story. 
I was at the Learning Solutions Conference in 2019. And what ended up happening was I was in this breakout session. And inside this breakout session, Peter, you had Qatar Airlines there. You had HSBC Bank there. You had, you know, all these big companies. And there was one lady there. She was very vocal. And I really appreciated her because she was very vulnerable and expressing, you know, what's going on, right? Vulnerability creates relatability. And it's awesome just to, just, just to, allow to, just to hear what was going on. Yeah. She was from this prestigious uh, hospital in Cleveland. Right. And she was just letting spill in the beans, Peter, just, you know, we don't understand why our employees are just not engaging. We're producing this and we're doing this and we're doing that. And we have the best, you know, most robust systems and they're just not engaging. I mean, that was the big breakout session was problems with engagement. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what ends up happening is at the end of the breakout session, I approached her and, you know, and I, and I, and I said in a, in a non condensing, uh, condescending way at all, I just asked her, I said, you know, you, you just expressed that you were having some trouble engaging your employees. And she's like, yeah, we just can't figure it out. And I look at her, Peter, and I say, did you ask them? Have you asked them what they want? Have you asked them how they want to grow? Have you asked them what hard skills and soft skills are important to them? Her eyes opened up like I discovered not gold. I discovered diamonds. <laughs> like it was this concept that she had never heard before, right? And that's what we encourage everybody. Every decision that you make from the learning management system, from the content, from the this, from the that, you've got to talk to your learners. You've mm. got to hear what they need, what they want, how they want to grow. If you start making any decisions before yeah. consulting them and advising you're going to waste a bunch of time and money. We've seen it over and over again, and we want to help people save that time and save that money. It's funny, um, as as somebody who is not, I'm not a coder, I, I'm not a designer, UX designer, but I'm around it a lot. Speaking to professionals like yourselves where you're building these platforms and, and helping people, it's always been consumer-driven. And so in schools, it is becoming in the most innovative schools you nailed it on the head are becoming student driven um i just had an opportunity in the podcast right before this one we talked to a couple of superintendents they're sitting students down in school board meetings yes great. right yes that's great right so uh, with with those types of of things happening um in in your experiences not only with businesses and and uh, hospitals, like you were saying, and, and people with these struggles, where would you recommend most the biggest changes in addition to putting students first in education Where from your lens right now? I think one of the reasons why traditional education, um, especially like the big like brand name universities have, have fought it so much is um, because there's a certain price tag you can charge for a, um, for a student, you know. But what what I've really, um, and, and, and what we've seen is since blended learning is like the new thing, right? There's all these high schools opening up where there's like a, I don't know, you have like 200 square feet, right? And it serves hundreds of, uh, no, no, sorry, 2,000 square feet, and it serves hundreds of students. Um, and it, it, it's the, the same thing can be applied to large universities. Now, if you talk to the students, what they're going to say is their favorite thing about college is interacting with each other. Well, instead of spending all the money building more and more classrooms, on campuses what if you spend the money and build more and more dorms and then you actually scale back the classrooms and you integrate blended learning into an uh, into a university setting where it's um you have all these professors now teaching at home but also sharing space right so now we have like shared space is like what, what, what we've done with we work and all these places right where we have shared space shared lecture halls which we already have but even when we were in college like they're empty most of the time right so now you're saving yourself a ton of money on um this infrastructure you're 
catering to what your college students want, which is the social experience, right? More college students, right, around. And then you can still have online with, I don't know, maybe you have like one day or two days of like lectures a week that are in the classroom. You just schedule it. And now you're saving a ton of money on your footprint that isn't used a lot of the time. And then you're spending more of your money on housing. And then what you can do is probably cut your, you probably cut your price in half, which is going to attract more people. And then we're not paying $70,000 for your school now. You know, we're paying 35, but you're attracting more students and your costs are lower. Um, so that's what I think. I think that that's like where we need to go. And then you're really catering to what the college students want, right? They want the dorms. They want the cl- They want the clubs. They want the, um, uh, you know, like I played intramural Frisbee throughout college. I play, um, I was, um, I wrote for the Clarion newspaper, like uh, movie reviews throughout college. Like that's the type of stuff that makes a college experience, a college experience and the, like the social piece. And then the education piece, um, you just gotta, like everyone's on their phone anyway. So let's like, <laughs> right. let's blend in that learning and you're actually gonna save a lot of money. Like you are gonna save a lot of money and you can still pay your teachers probably better than they're getting paid now because yet again you're not investing in um the new building and 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 updating the roof on this building you know like that aren't even used that's the crazy these these universities have these buildings that aren't even used which i understand there's like there's culture in like the old ones well great let's just use the old ones Mm -hmm. let's stop building the new ones let's just use the old ones and then do everything else online so that's what I think when, when we are talking about what uh, where things should go. Because I we're also really big on personal connection. Mm-hmm. Like social connection is so important. It's the one biggest challenge other than selling uh, other than selling a course to a learner. The biggest challenge is how do you integrate social interactions into e-learning and, uh, and online learning. That is like, we could do a f- another podcast in like six months. <laughs> no, you but, know what? It, it makes me think of, okay, first off, as I got my, my degree, I got uh, a bachelor's, um, and that's the first thing I do remember is with people. It's absolutely correct. And I'm old enough, I'm the old guy in the room, um, that where, you know, the internet was evolving, um, and one of my, uh, friends was actually overseas and we were doing the, you know, the typing on the, you know, TSR 80 or whatever they were back then. And that's, that's awesome. what I remember. I was like, oh my gosh, he is over in Amsterdam right now. I'm in Indiana and I'm talking to uh, him. So I appreciate that. I think, I think that's wonderful. Uh, that's going to be tough to outdo there, Hector. What, what kind of things do you, uh, do you see, uh, changing in, in education? Absolutely. I, I, I think Johnny hit the nail on the head. Um, the one thing that, you know, I start seeing a lot of now and, you know, kind of going to the concept of blended learning. So here's what I see going on right now. The university setting has the most competition it's ever had. And let me tell you why. I can go to the University of Denver, and I've heard now that the tuition there is, you know, Which pushing six. By the way, we love DU. DU, you're awesome. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, we love awesome. you. We're pioneers. <laughs> We're pioneers, right? You know. So, but this applies to any any private university, right? You know, you go, you can go to a private university, and we'll just say the tuition is fifty thousand dollars a year, a four year degree. That's two hundred grand. Yeah. Or, I can go to an online trade school learn cybersecurity training, coding in six months, pay 20 grand and pretty much get an almost guaranteed job for 60 to 70 grand a year starting salary. Mm -hmm. Right. And then there's these coding boot camps to just like a a friend of mine, I I forget what he did his undergrad in, but he, he did like a six month boot camp to be a software engineer. And now Facebook's paying him like $250,000. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So it's just like, so this is, but what Johnny said is very true. What is holding the university setting? It's that social connection, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so what I see maybe happening as well is trade schools and online universities solely 
partnering with universities because what do universities have? They have campuses. Mm -hmm. So to me, as a business person, that's a revenue opportunity is if they have a partnership or an alliance with one of these trade schools, then they can offer monthly memberships to be a part of the University Denver Social Club or whatever you want to call it. And if you pay $500 a month or $1,000 a month or hundred, whatever it is, you know, your school students from the trade school can come and u utilize University of Denver, uh, the, the, the campus or, you know, whatever, uh, whatever private school campus um, and, you know, play your ultimate Frisbee and get at that social aspect as well you know so i definitely think that universities are going to have to start innovating and from a business perspective because hey at the end of the day you know every single institution is a business in some way shape or form mm -hmm. right they need money to survive right you know so i think they're they're going to start getting creative and saying instead of in addition to us building out our online university and our online learning programs instead of instead of trying to ignore what's happening in the background how do we capitalize on partnering with them? Because we know what we have is something that they don't have, which is a big crush for people that really want that university experience. And that is the social aspect. So how do we build that within our model? I, I don't know how it's going to pan out, but I have a feeling that we're going to start seeing these partnerships. It's going to be another revenue generation opportunity for universities. Uh, where at that point, it's, it's pretty much, you know, not solely profit, but the, the cost of developing everything is done, right? You know, so to them, you know, every single member is almost, you know, pure profit at that point, right? Right. You know, uh, but uh, so I, I feel like something like that is going to start, you know, happening as well. So it's going to be really interesting to see what's going to happen. You know, I, I would tell you, Peter, you know, in the next 20 to 30 years, but now because of COVID, in the next five years, man, I really feel like things just really accelerated because everybody was forced to move online. It's exciting because I think when when you look at these happenings, um, and somebody said it somewhere, I was on a clubhouse chat, but they were talking about um, we have never had an education industry. We've always had a credential industry. And what you're talking about here is that social aspect because I, I I personally myself I went into business with one of my roommates in college you know back in the day um, and I have a business minor and I learned way more about starting a business so why not you know build the structure of the university around that and then have the access which is worldwide soon to be Mars wide right um, where you are you are actually have access uh, to that. That's amazing. I love these two ideas um, and, and concepts, and I can't wait to see what happens. Tell me about where you all are going forward with your business. We have a renamed business coming out there, um, and I'm excited. I, I know when this thing uh, goes out, the business is actually going to be underneath there. I have a feeling, um, and because we're just right at the decision point of that. But tell us where you all are going as a company from here forward. Um, what does that look like for you all? We went into this mode of like, how do we help as many organizations as possible and continue as the going concern, <laughs> you know, like right. um, for for a few months. And um, it's interesting because because we are at the uh, at the point now where it's like, where what is the future of e-learning partners and um the reality is like we said we're learner centric so what we're focused on is how do we scale out what our offering is right now to as many individuals and companies as possible because we it, it, it's really interesting like what you said for years, we were trying to figure out, okay, what industry should we focus on, right? Within, edu like, we're like, well, we do, we, we've done technical medical training. We've done cybersecurity training. We've done irrigation system training. Uh, now we're doing, um, we're, we're, we, we have a program we're working on helping high schoolers find the music school of their dreams. We're working on a geometric tolerancing manufacturing training, um, um, a voter um, instruction, like teaching you how to use voting. So like the list goes on and on and on and on. So I think what's really cool and why we have such a 
big opportunity is, as you said, the education industry is our industry. And what we do applies to all of it. Like our A to Z stress-free um, saving time and money solution. So what we're trying to figure out is how do we scale it? And the answer is pretty ironic, e-learning. Our heart, we are so focused on online learning. And really, you know, Peter, uh, where I see uh, the company keep growing and, and uh, where we're growing towards is making it simple and scalable, right? Nothing cringes us, you know, more than A, people that are ignoring their learners and B, companies and institutions that it's taking them not months, years to take, you know, 10 hours of content, right? and transforming it into a course especially micro learning right yeah. you know i mean it's just you know one of our one of our former clients came up to us they had 100 hours of highly technical content right they wanted to make it up of four courses and you know we had to create hundreds of micro video learning lessons and traditionally that would take a company you know months if not years it took us five months mm -hmm. right you know, so our, our goal is just as we're entering this e-learning, as we're entering more and more into online learning and companies and solarpreneurs and subject matter experts needing this, how do we make it learner centric and continuously push it learner centric? And then how do we help them build it at scale? Yeah. Right. You know, because that, that's another thing, Peter. Right. You know, is that when you when you go to online learning, a, a lot of people think it's easy. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's like a car. I, I like to use a car analogy. It's, oh, you know, that's simple. You jump in the car it drives from point A to point B. No problem. Right. Then you pop open the hood and you're like, holy crap, that's what it takes to make an engine. <laughs> Damn. Right. You know, so and, and that's all my learning is it, it, to make it work. You know, there's so many pieces to it. And time and time again, whenever we're working with a company that already has an internal learning department or we're working with a company that doesn't have an internal learning department and we're basically their learning department, right? You know, they're, they have multiple people and in many cases, multiple vendors, sometimes six or seven vendors doing one thing, right? right. So, and that's, you know, and that's what we saw. So as we mm -hmm. continue pushing forward, how do we simplify it? How do we scale it? How do we help not just companies, but solarpreneurs, Peter, you know, when you hear custom, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Expensive, yeah, right? right? You know, how do you make something, you know, help them capture their dreams and allow them to scale it on their own as well? And that's, those are the Da Vinci codes that we've been able to crack. And we're going to keep cracking them as we keep going forward. Because whether if you're a solarpreneur or if you're a business with 10,000 employees, you know, we will teach you how to simplify it, scale it make it your own and make it what you want. I can envision schools themselves like districts. This is their their brand. You're working uh, with them on an individual building around their culture and what that one. And then you go to the next one and the next one. Uh, I think the, the individualized communities is key. And I love that that angle that you're taking with it. Because this is just a problem that we get asked all the time. And it's um, no one knows what technology they should use when it comes to online learning like no one knows yeah and um and we actually get um uh um and and one of the reasons why we're, we're renaming is because people i think are so stressed out about that question of like what lms do i choose or bms or the 17 other three character <laughs> we like acronyms in education <laughs> acronyms, <right? laughs> um and p people, when they first kind of hear of us, they're like, oh, well, t tell us about your platform. It's like, hey, like, there's enough platforms out there. There's like hundreds that you can probably search online, thousands if you look long enough, tens of thousands because a lot of them just uh, don't have the best SEO budget, probably hundreds of thousands when you're talking about um, uh, uh, apps like Loom, or video ask, or even Vimeo, or YouTube, and you basically include all these these learning systems that aren't branded as learning systems, but they are learning systems. Even like Excel is a learning system. Mm -hmm. We actually help multiple clients build out programs in Excel, test it on their learners, and then help them pick an LMS. Um, well, anyway, the point is, there's a lot of noise out there when it comes to the technology and education. Like, if you don't believe the three of us go to a e-learning conference mm -hmm. 
go to an e-learning conference, 90% of the vendors there have a platform. And I'll tell you this, once you're there in like the showroom for about 30 minutes, you're not going to, well, first of all, you could probably talk to 30 platforms and you're not going to remember one of the names, except maybe Adobe. You might remember Captivate <laughs> and you and you may remember Storyline because their logos are everywhere. Mm. Um, but the reality is when you look at the technology and really what we're trying to figure out, and this is like when you're talking about big vision, so I, I we both gave you an, an answer more of like, what are we um, uh, doing on a kind of grassroots level? Mm -hmm. But when we're talking about like big vision, we just want to really provide clarity, right? So Hector was talking about like this A to Z solution, simplifying things. Well, we're working on our own um, our own proprietary software to tell you which software is best for you, mm -hmm. which um, which is what we believe is really needed out there. And it's not the admins that should be making that decision. It's the learners, right? Yet again. So that's the big vision. Don't know when that's going to be ready because it's so complicated that, w and we don't want it to be complicated, right? End right. user, the learner, um, or whoever's choosing the software platform. Um, people spend years trying to figure out the best platform, right? Yeah. That's another reason why the universities take so long and, and ed educators take so long because they're like, God, do we go with Moodle, Blackboard, mm -hmm. Canva, or – and those are the only three they know, mm -hmm. which is crazy. Right. <laughs> oh, no, Peter, no. If it's, I wanted to add to that too, you know. I mean, what, what Johnny is saying is, is super powerful. And, and for everybody that's listening out there, we, we want you to know – that the learning management system, is it important? Yes, but the most important thing is your learner. Now, we will say this, we will say this, we understand why you believe the learning management system is the most important thing. Because guess who has all the advertising and SEO space? <laughs> the learning management systems, right? They're That's the ones that are pushing it. Mm -hmm. They're the, exactly, they're the ones that, you know, if you type in, how do I start? online learning guess who has all that advertising space it's the learning management systems right, right? you know so we understand that you're kind of caught up in that but let me going back to the car analogy i love the car analogy <laughs> right you know peter you know I'll, I'll pick on you what type of car do you drive my friend acura you drive an acura mm -hmm. right i drive a toyota right both of our cars do the same thing they drive from point a to point b all learning management systems they do the same thing they teach a learner, but, but they're completely different experiences. Yeah. The reason why you drive your Acura versus me, why I drive my Toyota is because of the experience and what we're looking for, the features and the benefits and the overall driving experience. Same with the learning management systems. Those features and those benefits provide an experience, right? And it's our job to understand what experience is the learner looking for, what's most important to them, how are they going to engage best? And then find a learning management system, find an experience that matches those certain characteristics, needs, wants, and requirements. Do that, and I guarantee you're going to see a skyrocket in your engagement. That's one thing. Don't take it from us. Take it from our clients. One thing that they love about us is the industry average of engagement of learners is 30%. On a good day, 40%. Mm -hmm. We average out at about 80%. And in addition to multiple things that we do that is learner centric, when it does come to that learning management system, oh, you bet that we figured <laughs> out who their learner is, all those requirements. And like Johnny said, and this is where this big vision building proprietary system right now that we're building is what are the characteristics of your learner? What driving experience are they looking for? And then find a car that matches that. Gentlemen, I can't thank you enough uh, for everything you're doing. You're building out pain points uh, in education, um, and that's where we are. Obviously, you're doing some great things on the on the uh, B2B side as well. Uh, last question, how can people connect with you? We're both very active on LinkedIn, and then we also, um, we started our own um, little micro-learning show that we're developing more into a long-form podcast um, that we'll be launching at some point after we launch the new name. Um, all about micro learning. So yeah. the best place to connect with us would be LinkedIn, uh, Johnny Havy, Hector Samudis. Um, other than that, I mean, we do a, uh, weekly micro learning 
um, email course, mm -hmm. which um, a lot of people when they hear like, oh God, email list, like <laughs> they think it's like about us selling. No, it's like our our clients, our clients who like get time with us every week already um, watch the learnings we put together because of how valuable every single email we send out is. So yeah. um, how do you get on that list? I think you should just connect with us on LinkedIn and we'll figure out how to get you on the list. But it's um, we're all about micro learning. So even on LinkedIn, we're always posting stuff. Yeah. Educational stuff about micro learning. Yeah. So I'd say LinkedIn. Hector, is that about right? Hey. Exactly. You know, and guys, Johnny and I, we're all about building relationships. You know, Peter, you know, one thing that we talked about is that social aspect. So everybody listening to this, you know, if you're curious to learn a little bit more about what you're doing with your online learning, maybe we haven't even started online learning. And that's an itch that you have that you've had for some time, but you just don't know where to start. We would love to have a conversation with you, give you any advice that we can, hopefully get you on that right path, and most importantly, build a relationship with you too. So don't hesitate to not just reach out to us on LinkedIn, but if you want to schedule some time to connect, would love to meet you, would love to hear from you and hear your vision. All right, Johnny Hector, thank you so much, man. Um, I appreciate it, and uh, thanks for jumping on with uh, us at Disrupt Education. Thank you so much, Peter. It was an absolute pre a pleasure. We appreciate it. It's been fantastic. Awesome. And thank you all for listening. Hit that subscribe button. Give us a little bit of a rating there. Five stars always help. I'll talk to you next time.